Strickland. I have been fascinated with the unknown and paranormal realms since childhood. After a profound experience with my grandmother's spirit 20 years ago, I have been on a quest to observe, study, investigate, and communicate with the afterlife and beyond. It's been an ongoing journey of exploration and discovery, one that has taught me how mortality and the spirit world are forever bonded through the bales of time. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well this Thursday evening, October 13th. My goodness, time is flying by. So welcome to another episode of the Afterlife Chronicles right here on WLTKDB.com. Of course, I am your host, Nicole Strickland. And if you have not followed us, please do so with that handle, WLTKDB. And of course, the Afterlife Chronicles on Facebook, Afterlife Chronicles and beyond. And it's Podbean page, afterlifechronicles.podbean.com. Soon, or not soon, I don't know why I said soon. Hello, my brain, two wires didn't connect there. I was going to say, of course, I think for now a couple of months, the station does have an app. So if you're an iPhone Droid user, go there and get your app, WLTKDB, and you can watch the shows right there. I've tested it out. I've used it. It's awesome. I enjoy it a lot. Of course, get your merch as well. I am wearing, I don't know if you can kind of see my shirt a little bit long sleeved black comfortable shirt WLTKDB right there on the site as well. Uh, let's see here I have an upcoming class coming up on Monday San Diego Oasis I've done this now three years in a row. And uh, it'll be an introduction to paranormal investigation and research there at 10am uh, this Monday in San Diego, it's in the Grossmont Mall for those that are living in this city. And what's interesting about it is that it's a hybrid class. So those in LA and New York, I think it's New York City can watch it as well. Looking forward to that. One last announcement. So Brandon Wainwright, I've had him on my show a while back. Uh, he is the author of Tyson's Gift, an amazing book where he shares his spiritual journey with his beloved, uh, beloved dog Tyson. He is debuting his show on the network on October 27th at 6 p.m. Central. So that is called, I believe, the Tyson's Gift Podcast. So I can't wait to check that out. Without further ado, because we have a lot to talk about, I am very excited. This is his second appearance on the show to welcome Dale Katzmerich. Pretty much everyone in the field knows who he is, president of the long-running Ghost Research Society, an accomplished all-around paranormal investigator, author, speaker, has been on numerous radio shows and TV shows, uh, a mentor to many of us, including myself. So let's go ahead and bring him in. And uh, we, will, we have a lot to talk about tonight, which I'm looking forward to. Dale, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome. I'm doing good. It's Thursday toward the end of the week. So we're, <laughs> we're doing pretty good. And so I know I thought I'd start off with this. And I know you want to talk about an upcoming or not an upcoming an, an investigation that you did uh, on October eighth. But let's go ahead and because this is coming up, talk about the Midwest Spirit Fest. I looked it up on the website, it looks like a phenomenal conference. So tell us about that. Yeah, the Midwest Spirit Fest is going to be uh, uh, an all day event hosted uh, by myself and Andy Howell who is the uh, uh, venue uh, owner at, at the Thornton Distilling uh, in Thornton, Illinois. It's going to be on October 16th, which is a Sunday from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, we have a, a, a whole bunch of very top-notch speakers that are going to be there uh, giving uh, presentations on, on everything from um, uh, spirits along uh, the Rock River in Rockford to uh, out-of-body experiences, uh, uh, ghosts of the Black Hawk Wars, Ooh. 
American Ghost Walks and Chicago Hauntings, Haunted Cemeteries and Preservation, uh, Beyond the Veil, the Stories of a Haunted History Tour Guide, um, and uh, Paranormal Pickers, Dying of the Dunes, and even one on Ouija boards. So we got a lot of things going on. That's a, a plethora of different uh, speaking topics. I mean, I, if I lived closer, I'd definitely go. This is absolutely amazing. And I read, too, that there's a an artesian well on the property, if I read that right, from the 1800s. Do you know the history on that? Yeah, uh, the the artesian well had always been there. Uh, this, this, this building actually goes back to the 1800s or so. Uh, it was founded by a guy named John Bielfeld, so it was actually called the Bielfeld Brewery at one time. Uh, it went through a lot of different changes, including the White Bear Brewery and a lot of others. This was during the time sometimes around a prohibition. So, um, you know, this is a south side kind of area, and you'll, you know, the south side king at that time was Al Capone, and he didn't yeah. like, kind of like crowding his space. So we kind of let this one uh, low-level gangster named Joe Saltis pretty much run his brewery as long as he didn't expand too much into his territory. Uh, but the artesian well, it runs literally 24-7 and is some of the purest tasting water. So it obviously is real good for uh, brewing beer and other uh, spirits and so forth. Uh, it's also, besides the running water, it's completely... Um, the room itself is an arch room made of limestone. So you have... Oh, wow. A running water connection. And there have been a lot of strange things that have happened there. In fact, uh, back in history, um, according to the Thornton Historical Society, when the uh, uh, when the place had closed down for a bit, when it was kind of in between owners, they were doing some renovation, knocking down some walls, and they actually came across a skeleton inside one of the walls, uh, which they were never able to identify, but they, they assumed it might be somebody who had double-crossed the mob. This that would, would make sense, history. right? Oh, uh, my gosh. Former owners, when it was called Widow McCleary's, had all kinds of things, including uh, seeing full-bodied apparitions, shadow figures, and things moving about. So uh, it's not only uh, a lot of speakers. We're going to be doing investigations in the haunted well. Um, we're going to be having uh, raffles. Psychics going to be reading all day long. We have a number of top-notch top psychics, including um, doing spoon bending, uh, tarot cards, uh, palm readings. Uh, astrologers. Um, so it's it's a lot of stuff to go through the, the whole day. It's got it's it's, it's never ending. We got a huge vendor room, so vendors uh, can sell their wares, and um, uh, it's going to be a great event, I think. Yeah, it sounds like it. It's going to be fantastic, covering like all the different angles and in, in in the paranormal. And I imagine putting this together. You know, I've heard from other people that put conferences together. I mean, it's time consuming. So did you envision the idea of doing this? And I'm sure you're probably going to, you know, do it next year and the year after and, and, and whatnot, because it sounds like a phenomenal event. Well, it was kind of a joint, joint, um, um, you know, jointly came, came upon by myself and Andy Howell. Um, I had uh, investigated this place in the past when it was called Widow McCleary's. Um, I had um, asked for, um, we had a one of our members who comes from England. Um, he's Paul Adams, a good friend of mine. Yes, and he was coming into to the United States for the very first time in uh, in late May, and um, I showed him all around all the places he wanted to go, including going to, to Joplin, Missouri, to see the Spook Light and other places like that. And he wanted to see. He was really interested in gangsters and gangster history, so I showed him all the gangster spots in Chicago, and this was one of them. So we actually were able to contact Andy and he allowed us to go down there and do a little mini investigation in the well when Paul was here. And then not soon after that, we came up with the idea that maybe it'd be a good idea to try something, you know, as far as a paranormal convention here. We need more of those. And it's, it's you know, there's a lot in the Midwest and, and East Coast, but uh, Pacific Northwest has a couple that are really good. But it's weird. Uh, California really is lacking in that department. Mm -hmm. So we definitely need more more events and uh, spook light. You mentioned spook lights and I've always found these very interesting. There's one in, I'm of course in San Diego. So there's one in Borrego Springs desert, which is about two hours East from me. So, and you've done a lot of research on, on spook lights. What are the various theories as to, you know, how they're caused and if, if a lot of them have a paranormal origin? Uh, well, 
a lot of the folklore behind spook lights, it has to do with, you know, somebody losing their head in some sort of bizarre accident. Uh, one of the yeah. famous ones was was the Baldwin, uh, Joel Baldwin's light, the Mako light in North Carolina, the conductor that was trying to stop an oncoming train and he, his, he was supposed to be decapitated. And now people see what looks like a lantern light trying to wave off oncoming trains in the, the area kind of uh, it was actually seen by Grover Cleveland, uh, one of our presidents, uh, on a campaign trail. And he said, Mr. Mr. Uh, he asked the conductor, what's that light? He said, Mr. President, that's Joe Baldwin's light. So we actually had a very famous person see that. But other other possible explanations have often been uh, bandied about, including, you know, um, uh, car headlights and car tail lights, uh, swamp gas, will of the wisp. Uh, fox fire, which is a gas given off by uh, decaying wood, phosgene. Uh, some even say ball lightning, which is extremely rare phenomenon. Yeah. Um, I've investigated uh, quite a number when I wrote my book, Illuminating the Darkness, the Mystery of Spook Lights. That's a phenomenal and, uh, book. My goodness. Amazing read. So the, the one I, I, I seem to, to have some of the most success was the Joplin spook light, but I've been to a lot of different places. Now, we went to Joplin with Paul, and unfortunately... It didn't show up. You know, of course. I was really disappointed. <laughs> but Paul says he was just happy to be there at the, at the spot where all this all this had taken place in the past. And we might might go back to, down there uh, that way again. But uh, I've actually debunked a few spook lights, including the one in Watersmead, uh, Michigan, and simply car headlights and car tail lights. I've actually been to Brown Mountain lights, which are very famous in in um, near Hickory, uh, North Carolina. I saw a few of those flickering around, very, very short-lived kind of bluish lights. Um, I've um, not seen a lot of other lights, unfortunately. Some of the other lights are either have natural explanations or so forth. We went down to Gurdon, Arkansas one there. There's a, a light called the Gurdon light. And um, uh, we didn't see anything, but I had some cameras set up, some uh, 35 millimeter cameras with uh, uh, was taking time exposures, just keeping the shutter open, just clicking and holding the shutter open for a while because it was so pitch dark on there. And I didn't see anything at the time until I developed the film. And sure enough, there's some lights dancing around out there. Oh, that's awesome. That's so sweet. And I'm wondering, too, if, if you know, all this technology and if increased pollution may lend to more sightings of it. Yeah, sometimes it actually does, unfortunately. Um, you know, there there were um, a lot of people that, uh, especially with the famous Hookerman uh, light, um, that they said it was seen along a set of railroad tracks. Uh, and they thought that there was something because of the, the metal of the train tracks that was causing some sort of uh, uh, electrical uh, deviation or discharge or something, and that's what was causing the lights. Um, but sometimes, you know, atmospheric anomalies or atmospheric disturbances like um, uh, pollution, smog, um, you know, whatever the case may be, actually deters a lot of the spook lights. You see them a lot less than you normally would. Um, we were there at one location, um, I'm trying to think of what it was, but we had a big fog bank just suddenly roll in. Oh, uh, man, not, yeah. Seeing nothing that night. And a couple of times when we were down in Joplin, Missouri, you know, years, years ago when it was very, very active out there, uh, people would drive up and down the road, which is a gravel road, and they just stir up all this dust in the air, and you just have to cover all your equipment, all your cameras, so you don't get mm -hmm. dirt on them and, and uh, debris, and then uh, you have to wait until all this settles back down before you can actually see down the road again. Yeah, one of these days I'd like to get to Joplin. I uh, just, you know, spook lights have always fascinated me. Uh, I don't know why. I just, you know, not knowing what their origin is and just in the areas they they appear just like super fascinating for me. And uh, speaking of investigations, I'm sure Paul had an amazing time with, when he was out here. I think he was out here for, what, about two weeks? Two weeks, yeah. Yeah, that's, wow. I, I mean, he probably got to see pretty much every amazing historic haunted location in the Midwest. <laughs> so that's, that's awesome. But uh, speaking of an investigation, you just did one, I think you said uh, October 8th. That was uh, fascinating. Let's talk about that. Sure. This was in downstate Illinois. It's kind of an undisclosed location. So unfortunately I can't say where it was, but it was downstate right. Illinois. Um, and we do that specifically so other teams can get in there. If we, 
if we uh, start, you know, letting, you know, sort of the cat out of the bag, then everybody's going to start, you know, going there and creating all kinds of problems and so forth. So, right. uh, but we were down there with a group of individuals and uh, a few other people from um, uh, individuals that I know, like Sylvia Schultz. I think you might have met her. Uh, she was down there with me, Jeannie Chilton, who was down from uh, Missouri area, and, and, and Dean Thompson from uh, Alton was down there as well, and a few other people. And um, this building was pretty interesting. Uh, we it, It's a four-floor building. Uh, we had access to the building pretty much all night. Uh, it's abandoned, but it's in very, very good shape. Um, and throughout the evening, we were, um, there was some really amazing things that happened to us. Um, things that I have never experienced before, and that's saying a lot. Um, as we wow. were kind of... Um, Walking down the, the, the corridors, uh, we would begin to hear uh, disembodied voices, which is always something that fascinates me when you can hear it with your own two ears. Absolutely. It seemed like it was, at first it was a woman kind of going like, ah, you hear that. And not soon after that, there was like a conversation between a man and a woman. Uh, it, was, it was not nearby. It was kind of muffled. So we started to walk in the direction of where we thought the sound was coming from. We came to a crossroad and then it was off to the left. So we took the left and we walked down a little bit further. We stopped and listened and we had to make a right turn. And we walked a little bit like past two crossroads or two intersections more or less. And then it went off to the right again. So it was like whatever was there was kind of leading us through this building that's what it sounds like, yes. That I've never experienced before. I mean, the disembodied voices that I've encountered in the past, like the Trans Allegheny or other locations, have been very, very short lived. They're just a scream or or a yell or some sort of you know couple of words, and that's about it. This was like an ongoing muffled conversation. When we finally got to the area we thought it was, we we all stopped again, and we didn't hear anything. So we, there was a door in front of us, and you could see underneath the door, you know, like if somebody came up the door, you'd see their shadow or something. Uh, so we were waiting there, and all of a sudden, we were all still. We hadn't moved, and we hear, tut, 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 like somebody oh my on the other side of the door. It's a concrete floors, you know, so, I mean, they're real easy to hear. And we opened the door. Of course, there's nobody there. I mean, we're the only people in, in, this, in this building. So... A little bit further down, they come to another door, and it's like a dual door. One opens this way, one opens this way, and we're trying to push on the door, and it, it's not opening. So one person had been there before. He said, well, I know how to get around. I'll, I'll go around, and I'll see if I can open the door from the other side. And he said he just pulled like two fingers, and the door opened. And oh, my goodness. The door, and we couldn't get it open. And it wasn't locked. It wasn't latched. It was nothing like that. So something maybe had been holding the door shut, didn't want us to get in there. Um, we heard knocks. We heard, uh, you know, kind of raps and noises th throughout the evening. We had s several pieces of equipment actually go off. I was actually sitting down in one of the, the hallways, and we were all kind of be we were kind of quiet. We had just finished kind of doing an EVP session, and I kind of looked off to my left, and because something had caught caught in the corner of my eye. And I look over there and I see this, the best way I can describe it is like, like a white light anomaly. Mm -hmm. maybe five feet off, five feet off the ground, kind of shoot from right to left directly from my line of path. And I turn my head and of course it's not there anymore. And I was, I actually had the, my, my camera, my 4K camera filming down that direction. And I actually had it zoomed in at that point. And immediately it's like, I got to see right away if I caught it. It didn't of course, show, believe it or not, on the camera, which I, I did not show it. Wow! It. But it, it showed up in my eyeball. It's that happens sometimes. I it mean, does. you know, when you take photographs, a lot of times uh, people will take a photograph of something. They don't see something that shows up on the film. Sometimes the opposite is true. When you see something and you photograph it, it doesn't show up on the film. I only had that happen one other time when I was in a cemetery in Southwest City, Missouri, when I saw a strange miss of you know, right in front of my face, uh, kind of bobbing around this, this grave here. And then I took a, a picture with infrared film, you know, and then got the film developed. There was nothing there.
Oh, that's, you know, it's weird how that happens. Do you have any theories on that? Because, I mean, I, I've experienced that as well. It's just, it's baffling when it does. Um, no, I'm kind of mystified myself. I mean, yeah. unless, <laughs> unless it's to the point that, okay, the ghost is saying, hey, you see me, but now I'm not going to show up. Because somehow there's, you know, it's it's just the opposite. When you don't see them and they don't, you know, make eyeball to eyeball contact or something that they show up on film. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe there's some conscious way to, you know, if they want to be seen, but not necessarily captured on film or audio or whatever. I mean, this place sounds phenomenal. It's, it sounds like a place that needs to be protected. So, you know, responsible teams can go in and not, yeah, you know, not irresponsible you know, I'm teams going to go in. back on there again next year and uh, to um, really set up a lot of gear this time. Yeah. We had, uh, we had quite a number, a lot of, a lot of gear set up. We had a lot of um, you know, EMF meters and cameras and, and uh, REM pods and mel meters and, you know, everything that was set up. We had all the equipment we, we had there. And uh, it's just that um, I guess, you know, we all should have been filming since from the time we walked in until the time we left because things seemed to be happening pretty much almost all the time. We were sitting in this one room and um, we had this, uh, I, I think it's called a trip light. It's like a long uh, light. Uh, like a like a string that has lights on it, and the lights will turn colors when they're affected by EMF. I think right. it's called a trip light. I might not be uh, correct in what it's called. And um, part of it was in this hallway, so we went from our room into the hallway to the a room across the hallway, and all of a sudden uh, somebody said the two lights in the hallway are going off, but not in our room and not in the other room. So it's not like a short or something. Right. It was kind of blinking different colors. And about that time, we heard a noise in that hallway, right where that was. Of course, we came out there immediately. There was nobody there and the lights went off. So something was maybe curious about what, what those pretty lights were, got kind of close to it and set it off. I love it when you can get two different, uh, whether it's a personal encounter or a piece of data and they connect. I love it when that happens and you can put those pieces of the puzzle together. I'm wondering too if there's any like environmental, like geological or anything like that that's uh, contributing to the activity because it sounds like it's a lot of sustained energy there. I mean, that's, I mean, to hear a disembodied vocalization almost follow you through the property, I mean, that's, that's rare. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's near, it's near a river. It's not too far away from a river. Uh, so they got that running water connection again. Yeah. Uh, that might have something to do with it. Uh, that could be. There's also been some tragedies that have happened inside this building. So again, that might also, I'm, I'm being uh, cryptid as you probably can tell. Yes, yes. And I, yeah, I'm trying not to ask questions. I would like but, give it but, away. But basically there has been some activity in there due to, um, you know, untimely deaths or people dying mm. Uh, mm. in the structure. So, uh, you know, that may contribute to it as well. Um, I, you know, there are obviously, um, you know, you know, fluorescent light fixtures in here and there are you know said so there is still power to the building so that's something you always have to kind of watch out for to make sure that your equipment is not just picking up just the natural energy you know right. from the electricity and the outlets and the fluorescent lights um, but when you uh, uh, basically have equipment set up where it's dark and you're getting that as well, or you have you basically shut off all the switches and you're still getting that, then you kind of scratch your head and you say, well, that's not causing it then. Exactly. Wow. It sounds like a phenomenal location. I'm glad you had a chance to, to investigate it. And, you know, I like to pick your brain because, you know, you just have so much experience in this field. And so I want to get your thought on, you know, there's all this newer equipment that's being designed. What are your thoughts on that in comparison to some of the older varieties you know maybe from 10 years ago 20 years ago even or beyond because there's yeah. just so much to choose from now oh yeah absolutely i mean when i started out i started out with a um you know a, a 35 millimeter camera a cassette tape recorder <laughs> and right. uh, there was no camcorders i mean uh, basically camcorders didn't come out or night shot until about 95 96 so i know first 20 years I mean, I was using just an ordinary, you know, video camera, very bulky video camera in some cases, and uh, you know, 35 millimeter shooting, shooting infrared film. You know, my my EMF meter at that time was a compass, 
I mean, that's, you know, that's all I use. I mean, compass will point to true north unless it comes in contact with a strong magnetic field, in which case it would deviate to one way or the other. Exactly. So, um, you know, later on, as um, you know, there were some things that we were able to, or pieces of equipment that we were able to purchase, such, such as, you know, K2 meters uh, or um, um, I guess you'd call them cell sensors, um, the very early Dr. Gauze meters, um, you know, um, things of that nature, you know, they're not actually built for ghost hunting. They're actually built for other, other purposes to pick up magnetic fields uh, in buildings that could be uh, in, uh, you know, could affect you or be, cause damage to you because of high EMF. So those early pieces of equipment, we actually had to kind of adapt to mm -hmm. using them in the paranormal. So we figured, okay, there are fields all around us, you know, electromagnetic fields, radio, you know, microwave, cosmic rays, gamma rays. We can't see any of those. But if we have a piece of equipment that we set down and suddenly the equipment goes off and then stops, what do we pick up? We probably picked up a moving electromagnetic field that went past the meter, set it off momentarily, and then continued on its merry way. But again, some of those meters, those early meters, would, would pick up a wide variety even of internal AC fields like electrical outlets, um, fuse boxes, things of that nature if you were too close. So you got some false readings. So those early pieces of equipment were, I guess, as best as you could have for being that early. But then as later on, when people began to design uh, equipment like uh, Bill Chapel from Digital Dowsing yes. um, and many, many other people, uh, those people designed equipment specifically, specific, uh, specifically for ghost hunting and nothing else. I mean, that was the purpose of that. And that was very refreshing because now, you know, they were taking into consideration that there are, you know, electromagnetic fields in the environment that could set off equipment. And they made sure that, you know, like the tri-field natural EM meter, for instance, it cannot be set off by internal AC fields. I mean, um, you can put it right up to electrical outlet, to a fuse box, the thing will not go off. You put it next, next to a K2 meter, the K2 meter is going crazy in the red, the tri field's not. And that's what you really want. You want a piece of equipment that uh, you're not going to get false readings for. So the, the newer equipment is really neat. Um, I have about close to $15,000 worth of ghost hunting gear. That's uh, impressive, Dale. You could have used that 15000 for something else. <laughs> hey, uh, why, you know what? You do. I mean, you do this. So, I mean, why help. not invest? But, I mean, I think one of the best pieces of equipment still is your, your body. Really, to tell you the Absolutely. truth. Absolutely. I agree. See things. You can hear things. Uh, there can be uh, sensations of cold spots or your, you know, a charge on your body, your hair rising up, your goosebumps. Uh, you can smell things. I've even actually had one such encounter where I actually think I tasted something. That has yet to happen to me. Everything else, yes, but not that. Claire Gustins, I think it is. Yes. I was in wow. I was in Old South Pittsburgh Hospital. I don't know if you were ever ever there with us. No, that's one place I want to go. It's on my it's in literally my top five that I haven't been. Well, we so. went down there one year and uh, Jeannie Chilton was with us, and Jeannie is a nurse. She's an RN. And we were in the pharmacy. And we were just doing the EP session. And all of a sudden, I got a really strange taste in my mouth, and a kind of like a metallic taste. Mm -hmm. And I said, "And I said, I said, I'm getting a strange taste." We actually got it on video. I got a strange taste in my mouth, and she says, "What does it taste like?" I said, "Like it tastes like metal, metallic." She goes, "That's blood." And that yeah. would make sense. Blood. Because that's it. blood has that kind of metallic, tinny taste to it. It does. But being that we were in a hospital, it makes perfect sense. And I've never had it before or since. But uh, I always would tell people that uh, most of your senses can be affected except taste. But now I got to add taste to that because, I mean, you can come across things that sometimes you taste, which is very rare, but it does happen. Yeah, I've heard uh, there. I've talked to a few others who have experienced that. I have yet to. 
but uh it's gosh you know i mean but that it does make sense that that would be blood i mean it's interesting too that you were in the pharmacy when that happened too yeah yeah, yeah that's that's one place it's literally on my top five of uh locations i haven't yet been to that i want to go so yeah, hospitals are, are probably in some of the top locations we get stuff up yeah hospitals insane asylums and prisons seem to be the yes top. Totally, totally. Yeah. Todd and I just on Haunted Voices last week, we interviewed uh, uh, the investigators from a Nevada state prison. And so they were talking a lot about a lot of the experiences that that they've had there. It was pretty interesting. But yeah, I mean, Waverly Hills, and I haven't been since I, I went with you guys in 2009. That's a place I'd, I definitely want to go back to. That was just an awesome, awesome night. And what's weird about that is I had all this, these hours of audio and then my audio just completely disappeared. I could not mm. upload it. I don't know what happened. Nuts. Well, that's, that's kind of strange because I, I, we were down uh, investigating, well, actually up investigating the Beast of Bray Road. Yes, uh, I've heard on, of that. Uh, we were up there. We had permission to be on Lee Hempel's farm. Uh, we know the guy. We were there. He said, you guys can be out here all night. And I was actually videotaping something with a flare camera that looked like a, a, a something standing on two legs. And that's what this cryptid is supposed to do. And I'm, I'm telling everybody, look, look, I'm seeing this. It's walking right past the, the, another investigator. And we shined this you know, flashlight on. There's nothing there. And, you know, to this day, I can't locate that footage. Oh, man. Oh. Doesn't it drive you nuts? Oh, man. Sometimes so I, you know, think there's external forces out here that say, okay, you captured something, but now you ain't going to be able to find it or we'll erase it for you or something. Right? Like Gosh, it sucks when that happens. Yeah, I was so, I remember reviewing the audio from Waverly Hills. And then when I went to upload it into my it just, it, it just didn't work. I was just, oh man, I was so bummed, but wow. Interesting. So I'm wondering when you, when you shined the flashlight, when, where you saw it standing, did it, you couldn't see with your own eyes. You were just seeing it on the flare, right? Right. I was just seeing it on the flare. It was probably, I would say maybe 50 feet away. Um, it was at the edge of a cornfield. Um, we were just facing in the, one of one of the areas that this had been seen was along the perimeter of this of this field mm -hmm. uh, right on Bray Road. And uh, so we had actually been given a a, a guy a, 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 a tour in a, in a, in um being pulled by a tractor with a bunch of hay bales in the back was like <laughs> a hay ride. and we were stopping. He was stopping and showing all the different locations where we wow. uh, that had that been some experiences and that along that that trail past that cornfield was one of them. So we had set the flare up and uh, I said, well, I mean, you know, the thing with flare that a lot of people don't understand it will not pick up cold spots. Right. It's a contact reading. So if it comes in contact with something that's very cold, yes, it's going to show something up. Or if it comes in contact with like a human body or something, it's going to show bright red, but there was nothing there. And this thing was like, blue and purplish so this thing oh that's cool. nuts and you can literally make out the the legs now when you shine the light at it did you see it disappear on the flare or was it still there well it disappeared, it disappeared. oh wow that's oh um mm -hmm. so i mean i don't know if this was some interdimensional doorway right. that suddenly they just closed the door and they left because that happens a lot with different cryptids like the yeah. mom man and and the you know the dog man and bigfoot uh, you know, the Momo, the Missouri monster, a lot of these seem to like, they, they come and go, you know, in the wink of an eye, you know, they're like here and then they're gone. Are they stepping into another dimension? And I mean, if we were there, I mean, would we be in danger of also stepping in that dimension? I know it's just all these, you know, once you uh, find something, then all these other questions arise. And then when you think you have it answered, more questions arise. It's the most bizarre thing. Amazing. I'm looking at the time. Let's go ahead and take our one and only break for the hour. And then when we come back, let's get to some audio files and some ghost photos. Sounds so good. stay tuned. You are listening to the Afterlife Chronicles with special guest Dale Katzmerich, president of Ghost Research Society. We will be right back. Ellie 
Lee Weisenzell's psychic medium is a medical intuitive that specializes as a body code practitioner. As an energy healer, Ellie offers additional services that allow her modalities to be intertwined with energetic healing. Within your subconscious lies information that knows everything about you and why you deal with specific conditions. The subconscious can be considered the blueprint to your entire body. With Ellie working physically with your subconscious mind, we detect what negative emotions are trapped and where they are stored within the body that is causing you your emotional and physical pain. This work is designed to remove imbalances and correct them energetically, getting to the root cause of why you have your condition, to help balance your body so it may heal itself. Your body is infinitely wise and wants to be in balance. The body code is not only gentle for humans, but it is also a gentle process to help animals. For more information, contact Ellie Weisencell at the website below. Five or 36 minutes now past the hour here you're tuning right back into the afterlife chronicles i'm your host nicole strickland and of course tonight's special guest is dale katzmerick president of the ghost research society if you missed the first half hour don't worry it will be archived for you so uh we were talking before the break about the upcoming midwest spirit fest which is uh, put on by dale which is awesome i wish i lived closer or i you know i'd go there but i'm in san diego so that's uh, october 16th 11 a.m to 8 p.m at the thornton distilling uh, company and what city is that in is it thornton illinois dale thornton illinois. Thornton, mm -hmm. thornton illinois so if you're in the area make sure to check that out and uh talking about some other uh unique investigations that the grs team has gone on i forgot to mention at the beginning of the hour i actually met dale katzmerick i think it was 2008 at a conference up in near yosemite put on by jackie meter just she's an amazing individual as well uh i haven't seen her since that time so we're due to uh meet up again so i met dale and the team then and uh i'm really glad to be a part of the ghost research society now as it's i guess california coordinator so i really hope to get back out to the midwest and 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 investigate with with you guys uh it's, it's just and i a hope to get out california one year too one, or, i know right well when you do picture. yeah when you do let me know and we can plan a nice I guess, trip from Southern California up to Northern California. So we'll do that. So we have about 20 some odd minutes left. Let's go ahead and get to some audio files here. And then of course we have them queued up in StreamYard. So let's go, I just, I'm gonna go in order here. So let's go ahead and I'm, I'm familiar with this one. I was actually with Nicole Tito and, and Lisa Crick when this was captured, uh, Lincoln Theater. Uh, we were down in the dressing room there, but um, I'll have you explain it just because, you know, why not? But um, this is uh, the one from Lincoln Theater. So let's go ahead and do you want to talk about it first and then play it? Or would you yeah, prefer yeah, to play it? Yeah, we let's go ahead and do that. We'll do uh, that. Basically, this was, uh, there's a, on the stage, there's a uh, Houdini trap door. Mm -hmm. that Houdini was actually used to disappear. That was his, uh, his, uh, his yeah. illusion, I guess. And we were kind of like very close underneath to where this Houdini trap door was. Uh, and we were in the dark. We were just doing an EVP session. And this voice that comes through has to be a true EVP because yeah. if you listen to, the, listen to the, the, the question, the response, and then immediately another question is asked. So nobody heard that until we played it back. So Yeah, we were oblivious to it. So let's go ahead and play that one now, Lincoln Theater. Moses here with us to protect us. What are you going to perform tonight? Magic. What are you getting ready for? Tell who knows us here with us to protect us. What are you going to perform tonight? Magic. What are you getting ready for? Now that's just crazy because that's nuts. it is so distinct. It actually enunciates it magic, you right? Know, make sure there's no mistake. So we, I'm wondering if it's Houdini's ghost that we contacted there for one brief second because he was the magician 
I think that's actually you asking the questions there. I think, yeah, I think it is. And we, and, we did uh, not hear that and, live. The magic comes through and then you ask another question. So nobody right. heard it. So it had to be a true EVP imprinted on the, the you know, the digital recorder and then it only heard on playback. Right. And I, I always wonder that too, if it's Houdini and I, I believe Nicole Tito and I captured this on our recorders, but Lisa did not. I think it was her. Uh, and I, I think she had hers on voice activation. So maybe that's why, but mm -hmm. I mean, this is seriously, it remains to this day, the best EVP I've ever heard. So leave it to the Lincoln theater. Awesome. Yep. Definitely Very want cool. to get back there. That's just a phenomenal place. Let's go ahead and move down. I'm just going to go down in order here to St. Albans. Uh, you can set that up for us and then um, we can go ahead and play it. Okay. Uh, what's the EVP? It's the, oh, sorry. It's uh, We're Excited. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is St. Albans, um, which is in, uh, I believe it's Virginia or is it I West? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a big sanitarium and we were there uh, doing a lot of different sessions and so forth. And we were down in the basement uh, and we were running, I believe it was a Phasma box at the time. Now, Phasma box, if you're not familiar with that, it's basically, it's an application that you can get from extremesenses.com. Extreme it, it, uh, it is partly internet radio and sound banks, but also mixes with a reverb and echo effect. So it's kind of really strange sounding sometimes. And we were down in the basement and I think we were actually in the, uh, the drug treatment room at the time. Oh, wow. And we asked the question, uh, and we got this really kind of strange, like, oh, kind of voice that comes through. And I'll just let you play the rest of it. Yeah, go ahead and play that. Oh, oh. <laughs> what was that? Oh, oh. oh, something. Yeah, right. Are you excited for us? We're excited. Excited. Did you hear yeah, that? We're excited. Holy cow. Play that one more time. Maybe not. That's okay. Um I oh. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> what was that? Oh, oh. oh something, yeah, right. Are you excited for us? We're excited. Excited? Did you hear yeah, that? We're excited. Holy cow. And you see, I got uh, excited. You, I, I got excited at the response. <laughs> I love that. I that when I listened to it earlier today, I was like, wow, he got excited. Are you excited? And it says, We're excited. It's awesome though when you get yeah. captured. Phasma I box, like the Phasma box. The one thing we get the most responses from. The, the phasma box phasma box yes. i've you know i i was just saying i like it but i they don't i don't think they have an apple mac version yet it's just windows right um yeah that could be that could be it, it could yeah i think it should be i've used it and i love it I, I think it's great um awesome okay so the next one is um it just says ethnic and then come out come out okay yeah we are in the uh, ethnic heritage museum um which is as it says, it's a museum, and uh, there have been some reports of some some minor paranormal activity has taken place there in the past. Uh, nothing major, no you know full blown you know hauntings or apparitions or anything like that. But it's an old building, and old buildings retain memories sometimes. So we're actually in the basement. Uh, we went into this one room, kind of away from you know the rest of the noise from upstairs, and we found like a little staircase that was like underneath leading that used to lead outside it has long been closed up so we had a psychic with us sarah bacher and you'll hear her voice actually asking the questions and she's saying you know kind of like, i'm a mother come on come out or something or talk to me and then you'll hear the little girl's voice come come through Hey, sweetheart. I don't know if you know, um, we're here to help. You don't have to be afraid. I'm a mommy too. I'll do that one more time if you can. Hey, sweetheart. 
I don't know if you know, um, we're here to help. You don't have to be afraid. I'm a mommy too. Wow, these are saying, awesome. Like, come out, come out, but you know, you would I don't know who she was saying that to. It's like the girl was saying that the, the you know the EVP. And again, we didn't hear that at the time. So that was a true EVP. That wasn't like a disembodied voice or something. Absolutely. That's a great, these are all phenomenal captures. And one um, thing they, I just want to point out real quickly, I mean, one thing that really tugs at my heartstrings is when I when I pick up children's ghosts. Yeah, me too. I mean, I've heard so many call out mommy. I know. Or, help me or I'm lost or come out, come out or something like that. To think that a child ghost can still be there and not crossed over and maybe by herself in a strange place. It really tugs at my heartstrings. You know? Me too. Me, I am the same way. It, it is hard to hear, definitely hear um, child vocalizations. Yeah. You can clearly hear her though. He's a little soft voice. She sounds young too. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like six or seven. Come out, come out. That's awesome. All right, so the next one is uh, Elgin Casket Factory. Now, this is cool. So I think you just have one from this location, but it's the uh, It Doesn't Work right. file. Now, this Elgin Casket Factory, as I think we were talking before the start of the show a little bit, yeah. about this, this in, it used to be a true casket factory where they made caskets, mm -hmm. and around Halloween, they dress it up to be a play walk through haunted house where people jump out and they scare you and everything. So they have a lot of stuff that uh, doesn't work. I mean, they have like, a fuse box that's not hooked up to anything. Anything is kind of like dripping, you know, play blood and so forth. So we were there uh, and we had an SLS camera. Now, SLS camera, uh, if you've seen the TV shows, if something is shown yeah. in the mapped out area, it shows up like stick figure. So we had this stick figure in the distance and he was kind of touching and playing with the fuse box. Oh, so wow. If you're there touching that fuse box, can you turn one of the switches on and then you'll hear the response? Awesome. This is awesome. Turn one of the switches. Why? It doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work. work. There you go. Bang. I said, turn one of the switches. It doesn't work. That's pretty good. That's hey, pretty good. That was good. Turn them for us. Turn one of the switches. Why? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. work. There you go. Bang. I said, turn one of the switches. It doesn't work. That's pretty good. That's hey, good. That was turn good. For us. You can That's... see I'll get excited when I when, when so, Did you like clap that. your hand after? Yeah, this, <laughs> this device over and over again produces full sentences in response to what you say. I love it. Unreal. So I initially thought that maybe, well, somebody suggested this, that maybe we're actually broadcasting somehow our answers via Wi-Fi. So we disabled the microphone and we're still getting those responses. Yeah, see, that's it's phenomenal. Just absolutely phenomenal. And I, I love it when you can get full on sentences like this. Awesome. All right, one more. Um, or, uh, we have time probably for one more. Um, this is St. Joseph. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you have more than one here. So it's uh, some entered. Oh, okay. Uh, we were in uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in uh, Lorraine, Ohio, which unfortunately is no longer there. We were one of the last to investigate. We wanted to go back, uh, but then they tore it down. They, I don't know why. Uh, so we um, were in there and uh, the place is all wired up with uh, surveillance cameras to keep people out because they mm -hmm. do damage sometimes. So we were actually uh, doing this. Uh, uh, I think it might have been either a plasma box or I think might have been an obelisk in, in phonetic mode. And um, somebody had broken in, literally broken in. And later on, they had taken some buckets of paint and, you know, oh, uh, that's terrible. And everything. So the device that we had registered that somebody just came into the building. That's almost like them alerting you. Yeah, exactly. 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 And see, that's an example of how ghosts and spirits can be of help to us. That's awesome. That is really cool. Let's go ahead and play that. Seven. 
Some F S O M E. Entered. Some entered. Some entered. Yeah. That's awesome. That was in dictionary mode. Yeah, dictionary. Well, I, I found words. that. It was like some and then entered. Yeah. Have you yeah. found that dictionary is better for you than phonetic or is it just, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's much more um, fascinating for me in the phonetic mode because the phonetic mode does not use the built in dictionary. Right. It right. Has spirits form their own words by putting together vowels and consonants, forming words and then making words into sentences. So, uh, and then employing the speech synthesizer that's actually in the obeluses. So that requires direct input from something outside, mm -hmm. creating some sort of EMF that's then making some sort of language rather than just pull out an appropriate word in the dictionary. Right. Yeah, that's true. And I, I, I don't know if you were using the readout, but you can clearly hear some and then entered. Mm -hmm. That's That's cool right there. It's always neat to have a situation where they're trying to alert you or help you in some way. That's, that's really cool. And there's actually another one that I, I think I might've sent you that after uh, some entered, it said something like they left or they were captured or they something like that. Uh, because we later found out that security had caught them and the obelisk alerted us that security was taking them out. Oh, that's, uh, that's intelligence right there. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Oh my gosh. These are so cool. I mean, I wish we had more time to play more. I want to get to the, to the photos and I, ho I hope this is going to work. You sent three from your collection. So I'm just going to add these. Hopefully they'll work here and you can see them from your end. I'm going to add them to this. Do you see that there? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go ahead. This is, oh, wow. These, these are, I've seen all of these, but this is, this is so cool. And and what's funny and cute about this one is the guy in the white hat is oblivious to the fact that there's a ghost yeah. in the window. I think behind. they both are. See what had happened yeah. apparently, <laughs> this is a story. I have no reason to doubt the story, uh, but the, um, there was a woman living in this house and then she died. And then the son or the whoever owned the house was was refurbishing it. They were putting on a new roof. They were trying to sell it. And they just took this picture of them basically just kind of like tearing off the roof. And in the window, you see the, the old lady kind of watching them and making sure they're doing a good job. Absolutely. And does she, I bet she uh, looks just like the woman that passed there, I yes, imagine. Yeah, very much like her. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then you have that construction kind of theory over, too. Kind of gray hair. Um, yeah, oh. I mean, uh, I don't believe this to be fraudulent because I know, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know these people in the picture, but I know the woman who sent me the picture who that, you know, and I know her that she's reputable. I don't believe this to be an app or anything like that because you can actually see uh, the center of the um, um, the center of the window. Uh, outside the woman. So in other words, she's not, it's not, you know, she's in front that would have obscured that. She's like behind it. So exactly. Um, it's one of the most interesting ones I've seen. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing capture and going on the, you know, the construction theory too, you know, maybe that made her easier to, to come through. I don't know, but amazing. What you when, when people are actually, uh, you know, changing the floor plan, you know, changing things in the homes, moving things around. It sometimes maybe upsets the spirit because they like to remember the place as they knew it where they were alive. Right. Absolutely. Amazing. What year was this again? Um, I don't, I don't recollect right off the tip of my head. Yeah. I was yeah. just curious, but gr great, great capture. Let's go on to the next one. This is also my goodness. Wow. Yeah, this was actually taken in an abandoned home, an uh, abandoned wow. house uh, out in the middle of nowhere uh, by uh, a group of teenagers who decided that they wanted to just to go out there and try to scare their girlfriends one night. And they went out there with some night shot cameras and um, they were just filming uh, the, the entire area, um, the house and so forth. 
and this is actually um, a, 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 a frame from the video. So I actually have video of this. Uh, basically, if we, um, maybe in a future show, I can give you an edited version of that. If you yes. Can watch the video of this thing, actually, this this figure fading in and fading out, which is really amazing. Wow. What they did, uh, what you see is you see the shadow of, the, of somebody in the room. That's the shadow. Okay, that's, yes. the, real, that's the real person. But sitting in the chair, um, somebody had illuminated this chair with a flashlight, an old flashlight, because you can see the, the black in the center where the bulb would be because newer flashlights don't have that because they're LEDs. But this um, this is one of two apparitions that were actually caught on that night. The first was being a girl in a doorway that was there for just three frames of three frames and was gone. Uh, the only reason that they found this is they went frame by frame and they found this 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 little girl or a boy, I think it's a little girl, is actually sitting in the chair with their knees pulled up to their chest like in a fetal position. Yes. And um, it, it fades in, it fades out, it fades back in again and fades out all within that's, maybe 15 frames. That's, you know, that's rare to have that. It is. It's one of the most experience. interesting videos that I've ever seen. Somebody sent this to me. It was like a gigabyte or something that they shot. And um, I don't think that they had the know-how to fake this because uh, this would take a major production or some, some real sophisticated editing software to do something like this. And nobody saw it uh, at the time. Nobody felt anything at the time. Except they got a little creeped out. They were just in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that's when that's when these phenomenal captures can happen. Yeah, this is one I hadn't seen on your site before. This is great. As is this third one as well. Yeah, this one was actually taken by me um, in uh, 1979 uh, with wow. high-speed infrared film at a place in Chicago called Jane Addams Hull House. Uh, now, Jane Adams Hull House, located on Halstead and Polk in Chicago, has a long history of paranormal phenomena uh, dating back to the time of Jane Adams around the uh, early 1900s when she took over the, the building uh, from being a tenement house. And she was warned by people living in the house to leave a pitcher of water on the top stair of the attic. Otherwise, the ghost from the attic would come down and create all sorts of problems. <clears throat> she paid no attention to this, and things began to happen soon after. Um, doors opening, figures walk, walking around, noises and so forth. And we were there one evening on a ghost tour, one of my excursions into the unknown ghost tours. And um, I had just stopped. Uh, I always take pictures. This is close to Halloween, actually. So I didn't expect anything to show up on Halloween day. But, you know, ghosts can show up any time of day or night. And I was just there and I just kind of, you know, shot over there uh, up the stairs. And you can actually see at least four figures on yes the, uh one by on the far right uh, like by the banister uh two on the far left and they look like they're slightly different size because they might be standing on different steps and the one in the center is the most interesting because he looks like he's he's um he's like a, like a cowl or a hood on his head yes i see that through and you can see what looks like his two hands kind of locked together in prayer coming mm -hmm. out of the, the, the habit. And um, they all were semi-transparent. Um, so I didn't see that. I mean, if I would have seen that, I would have taken the entire roll of film there. Of course. Something that, again, it was taken with an infrared film, which is a very narrow band of infrared light, about 400 to 600 nanometers. And a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So it's a very narrow band of IR light that this film is able to capture. And uh, since that time, I've had other people show me uh, images also taken of that staircase with just ordinary film that they've captured some strange lights or strange objects. And um, there's a chandelier right to the right. You can't see it in this picture though, but uh, um, it's missing the panes in the chandelier. But I've actually seen that chandelier on several occasions on my tour just start to sway a little bit. Itself. And yet the other one next to it is not moving at all. And it has the pain. So you would think the one with the pains might be uh, caught with the, the airflow and be moving and not the one that has no pains in it. So that whole area is, is kind of creepy. And um, 
Uh, of course, the people in Hull House, they don't believe in the ghost stories. You, know, you can't convince them of that. But the, No, you can't. But, you know, that's it's not our job to do that. But, I mean, you'd yeah, think well, after seeing this photo that they'd be a little bit more <laughs> yeah, open well, to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, this has been such an amazing, I'd love to have you back. Of course, you're welcome back anytime. Maybe we could do like a spirit photography episode if you want in the future, sure. but uh, yeah. you're a wealth of knowledge. You know, my mom was listening in tonight and she's like, good show. Nicole Dale has such a great wealth of experience. Yes, he does. Um, Ellie, a wise and self fantastic show tonight. Thank you for listening. And then of course, uh, Sandy said, uh, Turkington said, had crazy happenings at Hull House as well. So and I've heard from other people investigating this place that it's pretty active. But thank you, Dale, so much for coming on. Like I said, oh, you're welcome pleasure. back anytime. Uh, have a fantastic uh, time at the conference too coming up. So I'll be I'll be looking at all the the photos that people post on on Facebook and whatnot. So Absolutely. again, that is uh, uh, Thornton, Illinois, uh, December not December, Jesus, October sixteenth, eleven a.m. to eight p.m. Lots of great events and speakers. So check that out if you are in the area. So thank you again, Dale, for coming on tonight. And I hope everyone has a fantastic uh, weekend coming up. And then as usual, we will see you next Thursday. And remember, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. See you next week, guys. Have a good night. The truth is here and now on WLTK DB Talk Radio. WLTKDB.com.